So I have to say, after watching the, uh, the last couple of talks, and particularly that last one, I feel like a pink flower. Um, it's going to be very hard to speak after that, and certainly going to be very hard to speak at that pace. Uh, but uh, as a professor, uh, it is very difficult to get anything into 18 minutes. It's just not in my DNA, or as our <laughs> former president, uh, George W. Bush, would say, it's just not my A-N-D. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to do my best to, uh, uh, to do it in 18 minutes anyway. I just wanted to begin with a quote from Franklin Roosevelt, who I have to say is my favorite president, where he says this. And I'll do my best Roosevelt imitation, but it's going to be very poor. Uh, no business which depends for its existence on paying less than living wages to its workers has any right to continue in this country. Can you imagine a president of the United States saying that today? You're going to hear something else that he, uh, that he said, and that was um, uh, in, his, in 1936, he was running for re-election. It, it was in Madison Square Gardens just before his, con his convention address. And he said, at no point in human history have so many powerful aimed their hatred on one man. And I welcome their hatred. <laughs> Sound familiar to you from our leaders? No. This is a time when someone should welcome their hatred. Is our democracy tackling the big problems? Well, let's take a look. You've got jobs. You've got economic growth. You've got infrastructure crumbling. You've got education. We're now something like 27th. I think we're competing with Jordan. We've got poverty, it's a word that's not even discussed. We talk about people who are in the middle class are aspiring to the middle class, and everyone's terrified to say the P word. Turns out, actually, I just finished some research, you can say the P word, and you could beat a tough, racially, uh, racially coded message by about 40% with the general public, including white swing voters. Climate change, have we touched that? No. Immigration, sitting there. Oh, but we actually have solved a couple of problems. Well, for the upper 0.01%. And corporate profits, way, way up. So we've, we've solved these problems, but we don't seem to have solved these. So the question is why? Why isn't our democracy working? Well, you could, just, you could say that, the Amer that American democracy is kind of like the Wizard of Oz. In fact, it's really resemb it really resembles the Wizard of Oz. You've got the Tea Partiers singing, If I Only Had a Brain. <laughs> You've got fiscal conservatives who are busy cutting budgets, particularly to programs like Medicaid that actually not only helps, um, helps uh, people who are poor uh, and people who are working multiple jobs and, and couldn't get health care before, uh, it also happens to help 50% of our parents and grandparents as they age uh, and need nursing home care, which is something that people don't know of all, of all races and ethnicities. Uh, but cutting things like Medicare, singing, if I only had a heart. And then you've got the Democrats cowering in the corner, particularly when racial issues come up, singing, if I only had courage. Um, for those of you who, rem who remember the 2000 presidential election, vice presidential candidate the, on the Democratic side, that was my best Joe Lieberman imitation. Uh, 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 wasn't he the guy who played the cowardly lion? Or am I I'm, I'm sorry, I'm confused. So three prerequisites to solving big problems. One, a coherent ideology. For, for probably the most, the most important ideology that's for solving our, that we need to solve our big problems today is what's the proper role of government? And that's one that the Koch brothers right now are spending billions of dollars on marketing how to use the Affordable Care Act as a conduit to a broader discussion of why it is that we should dissolve the government. A compelling message to take that ideology and to get ordinary people to be able to hear it and say, geez, that's how I think. And finally, clean, fair elections so that that ideology can actually compete, or the issue that you're trying to, to, trying to work on can actually compete uh, in the marketplace of ideas in elections. I'm going to go through each one, each one of those in very brief detail. So, Kuhn and paradigms and science. Paradigms and science, Kuhn, Kuhn actually introduced this idea 50 years ago, this year. Uh, it's the idea that in science we have these broad orienting ideas that tell us models of, of the domain that we're working in, whether it's economics, whether it's physics, 
Um, those, the, the best example probably being physics and the, and the shift over from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics. You have a period of normal science, he described, where everyone accepts the dominant paradigm and they work within the dominant paradigm, but then things start to fall apart. Uh, they start to be, become anomalies that aren't well explained by the dominant paradigm. And then what you get is a period of revolutionary science, uh, usually led by younger scientists. In fact, Kuhn cited, I believe it was Max Planck, but someone's probably going to correct me, it was a Max somebody or other in Europe, uh, who, uh, who said that science progresses through death the death of older scientists. And uh, without the death of older scientists, you don't get much opportunity for the younger scientists who come in without their biases. But you have this period of revolutionary sciences. Someone comes along or a group of people come along, they come up with a, with a resolution to all of these anomalies and suddenly you've got a new period of normal science because you've now got a new accepted normal. What is a political ideology? It is nothing but a paradigm, a view of, thing, of how things are combined with a value system, a view of, hang, of how things should be. That's what a political ideology is. It is both, both reality grounded or should be and morally grounded or should be. What's our problem now? We're in a period of revolutionary science without any revolutionaries. Uh, and this is a period where we were expecting revolutionary science after the 2008 crash of the economy. And now what I fear is becoming the new normal, is becoming the new normal science. I see it in the polling that I do uh, all the time, uh, is that the average person is starting to accept the idea that working two and three jobs uh, for under the poverty line without, without benefits is now just acceptable. It's now just what you should expect, and they get angry at people. Uh, for example, public, public employees um, who, are, who have pension plans, because they say, I don't have a pension plan, why should you have a pension plan I'm paying taxes for? And instead of getting angry at the fact that, that um, GE paid no taxes last year, just as it paid no taxes the year before, and that's where their money is going. Roosevelt established the first real paradigm in the 20th century. Um, and that was, that was after the Great Depression, a period not very different from ours. <laughs> he essentially described the role of government in his Four Freedoms speech and emphasized this, freedom from want and freedom from fear. That everyone, he actually said everyone in the world. He did not say everyone in the United States. Uh, he said everyone in the world, but he obviously focused on the United States most, should have freedom from want and freedom from fear. That meant regulating the excesses of big, big, big business. It meant creating jobs and what he called social insurance. And I'm going to come back to that because it was brilliant terminology, although he had no idea of the neural networks that he was activating in doing that. When the private sector can't do it. Creating the conditions for opportunity. For example, the infrastructure that businesses need to create jobs and to create goods. Minimum wage. Unions so that workers can negotiate on equal ground. Unions is now a dirty word in our, in our country. As the percent of, of, of unionized workers has dropped, so too have the, have the wages of working people. It is the correlation is something like 0.8. That's as high a correlation as you get in social science. It is far higher than the correlation between uh, the average temperature in a city and its distance from the equator. Right? That's something you should know about unions. Um, Eisenhower and Nixon actually conducted normal science within FDR's paradigm. Eisenhower taxed the rich, the highest marginal tax rate. That's a term I never use when I'm doing messaging. Um, but I'll use that term here because I presume most of you know what it means. It means the taxes on the margins of once you hit, um, I think it was 600,000 back then. I can't remember what, what it was at that rate. Once you hit that rate, you pay 90% under Eisenhower. Uh, Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency. They were all doing working under the New Deal. And Eisenhower actually famously said, anyone who's against the New Deal is an idiot. He was Republican. Okay. Now fast forward to the Reagan, Revo the Reagan Revolution, the Reagan paradigm. The Reagan paradigm basically included this. Free market fundamentalism. The idea that if you just let the free market do what it does, everything will work out just fine. 2008 suggests that that was kind of disconfirmed again, just like it was under Herbert Hoover. So it was a return to the 19th century. Then, of course, there was religious fundamentalism, which was a return to the 14th century. <laughs> We're still in the midst of that in state houses all over the country right now that are pushing back on, on, on all kinds of laws. Uh, then you had this creation of an us and them, uh, capitalizing on America's original sin of, of racism, of, of slavery. And 
the, this was essential because he used words like, as Nixon did in his Southern strategy, to try to win over the South. None of you can remember the days. I can't, I, I can't remember them because I was only four years old at the time. Uh, when the Republican Party made a strategic decision under Goldwater to switch over from being the party of Lincoln to being the party against Lincoln. And the Democrats decided at that point very, very ambivalently to switch over uh, sides and to become uh, the party that, that, uh, that fought for, uh, for, for justice for people of colors other than white. Um, and for those pink flowers, like I'm speaking like, like today, uh, that, that um, I feel like after, after, um, uh, after the talk I just heard, I'm definitely a pink flower. I was been grown in really, really slow soil. But um, uh, the us and them was, 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 was developed in words like able-bodied welfare loafers and welfare queens. And we just saw it in this, in this state a few weeks ago with the development of a, uh, of a license plate uh, that, has the, uh, that has the Confederate flag all over it and a challenge by Governor Deal to uh, his opponent, um, Jason Carter, uh, his presumptive opponent, Jason Carter. Uh, oh, I don't really see anything wrong with it if people want to buy it. And that worked against, uh, against Roy Barnes in 2002, and Roy Barnes lost. Uh, and I, um, I hope uh, Jason Carter takes a different, uh, a different strategy and deals with a different demographic that he's dealing with that. Uh, the trailing edge of the Reagan paradigm is where we are now. Reagan's domestic legacy was a mass, mass of national debt. Uh, he, he preached the, the doctrine of, 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 um, of uh, small government debts, and instead, he actually tripled the debt from the time of George Washington all the way through Jimmy Carter, who he replaced. Uh, he gave us inequality not seen through the, since the 1920s, except it's expanded since. Gave us a polarized nation caught in a war of value systems, the culture war. No Republican has been able to bring together the strands of Reagan's paradigm since, and changing demographics have made it impossible in the 21st century. By the year 2042, this country will be primarily a non-white country. What does that mean? I've actually just done a lot of research for the, for the Carnegie Foundation, a number of other foundations on how to talk to swing voters about the changing demographics of America. And I'll tell you one really, really interesting, exciting finding. This is a message I never thought in a million years would work. It was about, the, quote unquote, the mixing of the races, although I didn't call it that. Uh, but that message about, about how Someday, just like we don't distinguish between Italians and Irish and anybody else who looks white, we just call them white, that sometime by the end of this century, we're, we're going to come in so many shades and so many colors like Brazil, that we're not going to have a word anymore for race. And you know what? That's going to be a really good day in America. And do you know what? That message about the mixing of the races, which was un unthinkable 50 years ago, that message beat the toughest racially coded message I could run up against it by 20 points. And do you know the groups that, that liked it the best were Southerners and people over 65? Now, that was a shock to me. I thought it was going to lose by 20 points. No Democratic president has openly challenged the Reagan, the Reagan paradigm. Uh, why are President Obama's approvals so ray? One is low, one is clearly race. But the other is that Americans expected revolutionary science. They expected a president who was an FDR, and what they got instead was someone who didn't want to fill those kind of shoes. And I think it's a shame, as someone who was a, who was a phone call away from President Obama for, well, then Senator Obama, for a number of months in, in 2007 and 2008. A coherent message is the second point. And you remember I said that there are three things that lead to big change. One is an ideology, uh, and the other is a, is a message to deliver that ideology. I wish I could get more into this. I'm not going to be able to, but I'll do it quickly. Three features of an effective message. One is they always tell a story. They always tell a narrative. Notice how our last speaker um, gave us this, these wonderful allegories. Alle think about, about the great monotheistic religions. What, what are their holy books written in? They're written in allegories. There's a reason for that our brains evolved to remember. Uh, they sing to people. They speak to voters' interests, their emotions, and their values. And they activate the right networks of association. Networks of association are interconnected sets of thoughts and feelings, <laughs> emotions, memories, values, that when you activate one part, you activate the rest of the network, but it's all unconscious. We have no idea what those networks are that are being activated. Um, the um, GOP messaging in its best. Government is the problem, not the solution. 
That is fabulous messaging. I mean, it sticks in your mind. It is a quality that, that marketers call stickiness, simply because it sticks in your mind. I wish I could show you these, but I'm not going to. I'm going to have to skip through. I wish I could show you Al Gore at his worst, but I want to show you LBJ at his best at the end instead. So I'm going to skip through these next couple of slides. Sorry, Al and Jim. Uh, why networks matter? Let me just give you a couple of examples. I'm going to skip through this. Well, let's not. Uh, liberal. This is a term that, that, that all the founders of this country used. George Washington used, them, used it to describe himself. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, they all used it to describe themselves. It meant that you were enlightened. It meant that you didn't believe in the divine right of kings. It meant that you actually believed that reason had some role in human life. Well, what has it got, to got connected with? It's gotten associated with liberal elite, tax and spend liberal, special liberal special interest, meaning uh, meaning uh, historically disenfranchised groups, uh, uh, particularly racial and ethnic minorities, means big government. All those things you associate with liberal. The right has spent literally billions of dollars branding terms like liberal over the last, over the last 40 years. It has not been accidental. Uh, let's go ahead and fill out the rest of the network. You've got Volvo driving, sushi eating, latte drinking, godless atheist. There you have it. Now, some of you are looking at this and saying, yeah, I'll vote for that. Uh, but most, most Americans, most Georgians look at that and they say, ooh. In fact, one of the most common questions I get from Southern, uh, Southern de Democrats running for office is, um, what do I do when my, when my opponent calls me a liberal? Because all you have to do in the South is say, he's a liberal. <laughs> Game, set, match. <laughs> Networks and the difference between winning and losing. The unemployed. Never say the unemployed. Why? Because you're turning real people with pain-lined faces into an abstraction. When you do that, you are actually activating the wrong circuits in the brain. You're now activating circuits that are so far from our emotional circuits that it's really hard to reach them. Instead, talk about them about people who've lost their job or people who've lost their job of no, through no fault of their own. In fact, actually, from a, from, a, from a neurological standpoint, you'll actually activate different circuitry right up here instead of right up here. And this circuitry right up here is connected to our, is, is, is more closely connected to our motion circuits. Entitlement programs. There's a reason why we should never use that term if we care about them. And that is, what do you think about when you think about entitlement? Well, entitlement, I'm a personality disorders researcher. It's the fifth criterion for narcissistic personality disorder, a sense of entitlement. <laughs> entitlement means handout. It means you think you ought, to, you ought to get something that you don't deserve. Well, that's kind of a problem, isn't it? What, what can we call it instead? Take a lesson from, from, uh, from Franklin Roosevelt. Insurance we pay for through our taxes. Well, you know what that is? People who take entitlements are receiving something they don't deserve. People who get, so, who get insurance with their taxes are actually being responsible because people get insurance are responsible, aren't they? And paying for it through their taxes just means it's a really responsible thing to do. I'm going to skip over that. Union and collective bargaining, I'll just show you because it's so demonized. And here's a way you can talk about it in the state of Tennessee that I tested out, that in a sample that was, that was leaning 13% margin for Republicans, it won by over 30 points against a tough anti-union message. And that was this. If CEOs can negotiate their salaries and benefits, then working people should be able to bargain together to negotiate theirs. Amen. All right, so last thing I'll say very quickly is clean, fair elections. Symptoms of dysfunction, I don't even have to go through these. Why did the banks that cost us trillions of dollars in wealth get bailed out, but the working people whose homes they foreclosed didn't? Why didn't we just give the money to the working people who has, whose, whose homes are foreclosed and there wouldn't have been toxic assets, would there? Hmm, wonder why it happened, it happened that way. Why has no major player been, been prosecuted on Wall Street? Do you know that Ed Meese, Ed Meese who was Ronald Reagan's uh, um, uh, attorney general during his administration, during the savings and loan scandal that most, most of you were not alive for, uh, but, but your parents were thinking about, um, not while they were conceiving you, but um, <laughs> that, that, that Ronald Reagan's administration put over 2,000 uh, Wall Street executives behind bars. Why are we giving $6 billion in tax breaks to oil companies while cutting unemployment insurance and Medicaid? Why did GE pay no taxes last year despite $14 billion in traffic, Why are, uh, in, in, in profits? Why are tax rates on the rich down two-thirds since Eisenhower? Why don't we have tax brackets at $1 million, $10 million, and $1 billion? As opposed to saying everybody $250,000 up now pays 40%. Why don't you say once you hit a million, you pay 50%. Once you hit 10 million, you pay 75%. Once you hit 
Well, a billion, everything above that, you pay 90%, because you know what that'll do? That'll get the people making a billion dollars to start giving money to charity that's what, and to their workers. That's what they ought to be doing. All right, so to finish up, <laughs> cancer causing the system is $1, one vote. And what we've just seen, um, the cost of the average Senate seats in 2012 was $10 million. What that means is every senator is dialing for dollars unless they're independently wealthy. And that has an absolutely corrosive, uh, corrosive impact on our system. One of the most unpleasant experiences I've ever had that will stick with me for the rest of my life was I was keynoting a fundraiser for, um, for a group of senators and I was watching them go around the room glad handling all these lobbyists and they actually had their checkbooks out, the lobbyists, and handed them checks in broad daylight. They don't even have to do this under, like, you know, it doesn't have to be a smoke filled room anymore. So, Citizens United and the latest McCutcheon decision, see no evil, hear no evil, legislate evil from the bench. I mean, the whole idea behind this, the, the idea that it doesn't influence you if somebody gives you a check for $20 million is so patently absurd. And the idea that it doesn't even change public confidence in the system, which is what just Justice Roberts told us, we already know from a public opinion polls that it does. And it's 80% of Americans say, I don't believe in the, I don't believe this, I believe the system's rigged because of campaign money. I mean, how much more, how much more evidence do you need? So to conclude, who hijacked our democracy and who can land it, land it safely? The great American class, middle class, was built brick by brick and it's being dismantled brick by brick. No one even knows how many Americans are out of work or holding down two, three, or four jobs just to get by. The jobs that are coming back are coming back at half the wages and without the benefits of the jobs that we've lost. 400 families in America hold more wealth than half of the families in the United States combined, 150 million people. It was not like that 40 years ago. It was not like that in my parents' generation who could expect that they could move up if they worked hard and played by the rules. So what do we need from our leaders? Will you allow me to just show a clip, even though I'm over time? Go on. Go for it. Is that OK? OK. This is, whoa, 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 let me back up. You're about to see Lyndon Johnson is at his absolute finest. We don't think of Lyndon Johnson as a great president or great orator because, of course, he was not a good orator. And as a president, he got mired in a war that he actually did not start, but he did not know how to finish, and it finished him. Um, his domestic legacy, however, was extraordinary. In the brief years that he was president, in his war on poverty, which has been widely discredited, he cut the poverty rate from 20% to 10% in the United States. That's how successful that war on poverty was. We didn't need to have poor people today in the United States had that war on poverty been continued. It's one of the great tragedies of American history. And much of that, tra of that, of that poverty is black and brown poverty. Uh, not all. There's a lot of especially rural poverty that's white as well. But it is, it is across all colors and races, but it is certainly disproportionate. This speech in 1965 for the Voting Rights Act came a week after uh, Bloody Sunday when 400 civil rights marchers, including peaceful civil rights marchers, including, I am proud to say, my congressman, John Lewis, who was at the front of that line taking a baton to the head um, and attacked by dogs by then Governor Wallace. Um, they were marching from, from, the, from the steps of, of, of a church up six blocks to a bridge when they were attacked by, a, by a, a, essentially a, a lynch mob of Alabama state troopers and police and deputized troopers uh, who, uh, who, uh, who beat them and, and sent dogs after them and water cannons after them. And it, it, it was so, I mean, the irony is that the, that the television networks actually cut to footage of it straight from a televised presentation on CBS of Judgment at Nuremberg, which I, it's one of the great ironies of history. Hundreds of thousands of people came down south to march with the, march with the mar, mar, marchers, and Martin Luther King was there with the marchers uh, uh, to go from, from Selma to Montgomery. And a week later, uh, Lyndon Johnson gave this speech, which was the finest speech of his career, one of the great, really great speeches of American history that people just don't ever remember. And I, I believe it is tru truly extraordinary. Listen to the courage of a man who said to his own Senate, 
which was Democratic controlled, but, but that included a lot of Southern Democrats and Dixiecrats. He said, you can filibuster as long as you want, but nothing that you want's getting through until you pass the civil rights legislation that, that's gonna make sure that every black person in this country can get to the ballot box. And if you don't do it, I'm gonna veto anything you try to send to me. And they filibustered for what, 167 days, and finally they passed it, and it became the, it became the law of the land. And this is now Lyndon Johnson at his finest. My first job after college was as a teacher in Cotula, Texas, in a small Mexican American school. Few of them could speak English, and I couldn't speak much Spanish. My students were poor and they often came to class without breakfast, hungry. And they knew, even in their youth, the pain of prejudice. They never seemed to know why people disliked them, but they knew it was so, because I saw it in their eyes. And somehow, you never forget what poverty and hatred can do when you see its scars on the hopeful face of a young child. I never thought then, in 1928, that I would be standing here in 1965. It never even occurred to me in my fondest dreams that I might have the chance to help the sons and daughters of those students and to help people like them all over this country. But now I do have that chance. And I'll let you in on a secret. I mean to use it. That is vision. That is courage. And that is what I challenge all of you who are young to show in your lives and you're particularly if you if you take up take up your lives in public service <laughs>